Hey there, this is MathCamp321 presenting the solution to number 32 of the Park Algebra 2 practice test. In this question, they're having us consider a polynomial function f of x equals 2x minus 1 times x plus 4 times x minus 2. And they go on to ask us a series of four questions about this function. So even though it's not required or asking us to do this, I'm going to actually graph this function. Students in my school hopefully can graph this pretty quickly and I think having that visual of the graph in front of you will enable you to answer the questions pretty quickly. So to graph a polynomial function I'm going to look at three key elements. They are the y-intercept, the x-intercepts, and something called n-behavior. Okay so let's start with the y-intercept. To find the y-intercept of any function in the world it's one simple thing you need to do and that is set x equal to 0 and solve for y. So if we go to the original function in the red box and we let x equal 0, we end up with f of x, which of course is the same as y. And if we let x equal 0, if we substitute 0 in for x here, here, and here, we end up with three numbers that we're going to multiply together. And they are negative 1, 4, and negative 2. And if we multiply these numbers together, we end up getting positive 8. So the y-intercept, as an ordered pair, is 0, 8. Now, the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to find the x-intercepts. To find the x-intercept, we let y equal 0. Or, in this case, we're going to let f of x equal 0. So if I do that, I get 0 equals 2x minus 1 times x plus 4 times x minus 2. Using the zero product property, I can set each factor equal to zero to get the three x-intercepts. In the first case, I'm going to end up with x equals one-half. In the second case, I'm going to end up with x equals negative four. And in the third case, I'm going to end up with x equals two. So these three answers suggest three x-intercepts, one-half zero, negative four zero, and two zero. Now, this third element is called n behavior. The n behavior can be determined by looking at the dominant term of the polynomial function. Now, when your polynomial function is in factored form, as it is here, it's a little bit harder to tell. And we don't want to waste time foiling or multiplying these three binomials together. So I just want you to imagine for a moment, if we did actually multiply these three binomials together, what would your first term be? Or, what would the term with the largest exponent be? To figure that out, look at the dominant term within each factor. And that would be multiplying 2x times x times another x. That ends up leaving us with 2x cubed. Now, there would be a bunch of other things that follow that, but that doesn't matter because this guy here is the dominant term. And this dominant term has a power that is odd and a coefficient that is positive. So this n behavior is odd positive, which is going to look like this. I'm not sure what happens in the middle, but the ends look like these arms, one reaching up and one reaching down. What I'm going to do now is set up some axes to quickly sketch this. Okay, so let me start by plotting my y-intercept at 8. One of my x-intercepts is at a half. Another one's at negative 4. And my third one is at 2. And I also have to follow this n behavior, which means if I start to the left, I want that arm to, to look just like this arm here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reach up toward that x-intercept of negative 4. I'm going to come down through my y-intercept, then through the x-intercept of a half, and then turn around and then go through 2. And then for good measure, I'll label some of these significant points. Now, if you had no idea how I did that or what I just did, you could always graph this using the graphing calculator. So the first question, part A. Part A says, what is the y-intercept of the graph of the function in the xy coordinate plane? Now, we did this by hand, and we get the y-intercept to be 8. But if you used your graphing calculator, you could also figure it out that way. So the answer to question A, part A, is 8. Now, moving to part B. Part B says, for what, for what value of x is the function greater than 0? The greater than symbol means to me above. So where is our graph above the line y equals 0? Well, there are two places, and I'm going to shade that in here. 
Here's one place where it's above y equals 0, and here's another place where it's above y equals 0. So the particular way we have to answer this question is it says select all that apply. So is it above, is the function above 0 for the x values that are less than negative 4? And the answer is no. But if we go to choice B, is the function above between negative 4 and 1 half? And that's a yes. How about between negative 4 and 2? Well, here's negative 4, here's 2. Not entirely, because we have this little region right here which is not above, it's below. How about between 1 half and 2? No, that's below. How about greater than 1 half? Not entirely, it's a mixture of below and above. And how about greater than 2? Yes. So these two regions are the regions for which the function is above 0. And I've delineated that by shading it in uh, with this pink color. Now again, if you don't know how I did this, by graphing manually, you could have gotten some of these same results by looking at the graph on the graphing calculator. Okay, on this slide we talk about parts C and D of the same polynomial function. In part C, it says what is the end behavior of the graph of the function. Now this idea of end behavior is something that I discussed on the other slide, but here it's presented in a slightly strange notation if you're not used to it. Let's consider the four options. As x approaches negative infinity, well, this whole thing, this phrase, as x approaches negative infinity, really means as we go to the left. So as we go to the left, the function itself is going toward infinity. Now going toward infinity, positive infinity, means going up forever. As we go to the left, our function is actually dipping down and farther and farther down each time. So this is not going to work. It's definitely not going to positive infinity. So the function is not going to positive infinity. As we go to the left, the function is going to positive infinity. That's the same thing, no. As we go to the left, the function is dipping down to negative infinity. Well, I like that as an option. And this is the same thing, so I like that as an option. So now let's look at this. As x approaches positive infinity, and this phrase means as we go to the right. As we go to the right, the function is going to infinity. Well, as we go to the right, is the function reaching up, up, up to positive infinity? And the answer is yes. So I really, I think I'm liking choice C. Out of the two that are left, C and D, I'm liking C the best. Let's read it through one more time to make sure what we picked matches with the graph. As we go to the left, the function goes to negative infinity. Yeah, it's going down, down, down. And as we go to the right, the function's going up to positive infinity. Yes, I'm very confident that C is the answer. Now let's finish the question by going to part D. How many relative maximums does the function have? Relative maximum, in the most simplistic way to think about it, means the top of a hill. So for how many points on our graph do we look like we have the top of a hill? And I'm going to say there's one. There's one top of a hill right about here. So I'm going to say there's one relative maximum. Now if the question had been how many relative minimums do you see, that means the bottom of a valley. And there would also be one of those. So this one asks just about the maximum. So we picked letter B because there's one relative maximum.